Berta Phillips, the CEO of the Prince George's County Memorial Library System. Over the past 18 months, the staff of the library collaborated with the Board of Library Trustees, community stakeholders, the Prince George's County government, Margaret Sullivan Studio, and Ashana Crichton of Art Growth to envision a new approach to serving the community. The result is the PGCMLS Strategic Framework 2021 through 2024, which sets the library on a path to affirming its role as an essential social impact organization. Equity, diversity, inclusion, and anti-racism are at the forefront of everything that we do, and we affirm that Black Lives Matter, period. The library will always hold literacy at the center of its work by providing a love of reading and working every day to ensure that Prince Georgians have equitable access to the educational opportunities, technology, and services needed to reach and discover their dreams. In this video, you will hear from several of my colleagues who will share the library's new mission, vision, values, and focus areas. The library plans for the next four years align directly with the Prince George's County Proud priorities. Education, youth development, quality of life, economic development, healthy communities, and safe neighborhoods. As we work together to recover from the public health, economic, and social unrest of 2020, the library's role is more essential than ever. All of us at PGCMLS our Prince George is proud to serve you. The library's new mission, vision, and values are a reflection of our heritage, our present, and our future in Prince George's County. We strive for these ideals together as a community in order to serve customers at every stage of life. We build relationships that support discovery by providing equal access to opportunities and experiences. We provide a collaborative foundation within the community for all Prince Georgians to create the world they want to see. We are Prince George's proud and put community first by being welcoming, curious, accessible, kind, collaborative, and resilient. My colleagues and I are proud to support the library's growth because what we do today will prove to stand and support our generation now and generations to come. The library's staff, board, and community stakeholders have identified five focus areas that will advance our work in support of the county's proud priorities. Many of our special projects are already underway, like our anti-racism virtual programming. And together with the community, we will develop more programming and services over the next four years. Inclusion. We strengthen neighborhoods by embracing culture, inclusion, and social justice. Literacy and learning. We are strong partners in education and promote lifelong learning for all. Personal achievement. We foster economic growth through career and business development. Creativity. We champion creatives and value their unique contributions to the community. Healthy living, we develop and promote skills and resources for healthy living. We invite you to explore the Strategic Framework microsite at pgcmls.info and to actively participate in the implementation of our new vision. The microsite provides an opportunity for staff and Prince Georgians to engage in a community feedback loop. Your voices are essential to moving the library forward throughout the next four years. And you are invited to connect with us on social media by emailing pr at pgcmls.info or by calling Ask a Librarian at 240-455-5451. Thank you. Welcome back. I hope you heard me all right. Uh, I think we we're having a few technical uh, difficulties. Uh, again, I'm Roberta Phillips, the CEO for the library. And we're talking about our strategic framework. Uh, the video that the staff put together was extraordinary because it talked about what we can do 
uh, and what we always do. So, um, Brett, can you talk a little bit about why literacy is at the fore of everything we do? Oh, I'm sorry. You're here. Myself. I, yeah. <laughs> I need to tell you first. Uh, well, libraries, obviously, if you just go back, the, the traditional role of libraries um, as repositories of books and, and information and learning, uh, certainly there's a, a very long um, uh, connection to literacy in the roles of, of libraries. And that's something that we absolutely want to maintain. Uh, we, as a society, as a community, we still need information. We still need to be able to communicate that information. And uh, the written word is still one of the very best ways to communicate. And so to ensure that the community, uh, all ages in the community, all segments of the community uh, have access to that information, have access to uh, the opportunities to learn and grow and achieve as a result of uh, being able to receive and consume and, and understand that information, uh, you know, that's that's a, just such a central part of what libraries do. Uh, so literacy is a part of everything. Uh, even if it's not called literacy, it's certainly a, a fundamental component of all of the various services and initiatives that the library is in, engaged in. Thank you. And Angela, what would you say to a customer who says, are we always going to have books? <laughs> um, I would say, yes, we are always going to have books in a variety of different formats, too, which is really encouraging, especially during these times. Um, I know that my child and I have utilize the online library and the Libby app and the other resources that the library has provided. Um, in addition to curbside pickup and um, book bundles too, which has just been an incredible uh, resource and, and a fun thing for us to, uh, to engage in. So I would say absolutely books are not going anywhere. Good. I think that's always kind of this, it's a fear of a lot of public who, um, have nostalgic memories of the library when they were a kid. But I think what some folks don't understand is all the things that libraries currently do. And I think that's why the strategic framework is so paramount because we're talking about not getting rid of core services, but really adding core services um, in a way that makes us both essential and really helping with social impact. Um, Nick, what's social impact to you? Oh, that's a good one, Roberta. I feel like it's yeah. the interview. Uh, so social impact is really like, you know, if you think about the library, we are one of the community, right? So we're, we are buildings, we are virtual spaces, but we are at the end of the day, we're, we're neighbors. We all live in this community. Um, we're passionate about public service and social impact is really about um, at the end of the day, supporting our neighbors and being there for each other in whatever way that's needed. And we've seen the evolution of that a lot over the past year because of the multiple crises, the pandemic, the public health crisis, which is, of course, ongoing, the e economic crisis that, you know, some of it was the pandemic and some of it was underlying conditions going on in the, in the market for several years. And the, the, the gurus in the finance world were waiting for the bottom to fall out. And then the public health crisis was the straw that broke the camels back there. And then the other piece of that is, of course, um, systemic racism in this country, which is part of, uh, you know, our society since before our country was even founded. And just those three things alone that we've faced in, in, over the past 12 months have completely um, flipped library services on their head. And it, it's not changed our values at all because we are still a social impact organization. We've just had to figure out what are some new tactics for making sure that we can be there for each other. So. A perfect example was um, in January 2020, we gave out 
coats for, for children who needed a warm winter coat. So we were able to do that back then and we had long plans to do it again, but then the pandemic created this need for many more coats in the community than we were able to offer the first time around. Um, because we were in the public health crisis, we had to figure out a different way of making sure that we could safely get those supplies out to the kids and the families that needed them. Um, but we were able to increase the capacity of our supporting kids with coats um, by almost seven times. And we gave away over 700 coats as well as 500 books we added bilingual books. We did it at five branches instead of one from the previous year. So despite adversity, um, when we're really passionate and really uh, focused on how to best serve the community, we can uh, grow by leaps and bounds. And, you know, social impact is a is something that we need to apply as a label to this work in order to help kind of evaluate it and kind of chart a course. But it is very much like that sense of community that is in our very heart um, at the end of the day. And, and it takes a lot of different expressions. Roberta, if I could jump in. Absolutely. To, to, to follow on Nick's comments. The library is one of those community institutions that's like the glue that holds communities together. It's, it is a connector. Um, and as a connector, as an organization that touches so many different parts of the community, all of the residents of the community, the various institutions, governmental, non-governmental, uh, non-profit, for-profit, by having so many connections to all of those different parts of the community, we can't help but have an impact. I mean, that's, that's what we do. And so the term social impact can sometimes have a, a very specific meaning, but I, I want to pull it also a little farther back to the 30,000 foot level and say, you know, we really are a social impact organization because everything we do touches and affects the community in many, many different ways because of, of the central role that the library has. Yes, absolutely. And so, when we started this process um, in 2019, um, we decided that we really wanted to get a lot of input. So we formed a staff working team. We interviewed stakeholders that included leaders of the, the county, our partners, um, our customers, our board members, why do you think, Brett, it was so important to get all these different viewpoints before we even started crafting this document? Well, um, I mean, uh, that ties into what I just said a moment ago, that we connect to so many different parts of the community. Um, and because of that, I don't think it's possible for a small number of people, say, in a central role in an organization like the library, can really know what's best for a community. Um, mm -hmm. That you you really do need, uh, to an extent, kind of a bottom-up approach of, of reaching out to all of the different stakeholders to understand their perspectives, their needs, uh, to understand their experience with the, with, with the library and what has worked and maybe some of the things that haven't worked as well as they could. Uh, so getting a good feedback loop going so that as a library, we know what needs to be done. We know what needs to be improved, or we know what things are really working well that need to be expanded. Um, and so we you know, reached out to many, many different types of stakeholders in that process. Um, and I think the, where we started first and foremost was with the staff of the library system, uh, because really the staff are the front lines in, in the connection to the community. They're the ones who really have the, the most interaction with the community. They, they have the most opportunity to learn from the community. And so it made a lot of sense to start there in our series of conversations and, and other forms of data gathering that we did uh, to try to understand their perspective and, and how they learn from the community and, and what they can share with us in, in the planning process. Well, I think that speaks to, to the kind of different approach libraries are taking in the 21st century. 
we used to think that because we had all the schooling, we knew what was best for you and we were going to tell you what you needed. And boy, did we get that wrong. I mean, now libraries across the country are saying, tell us what you need because every community is unique. All the communities we serve in Prince George's County are all unique. Um, and so we really have to think about what's best for each one of our library branches, even though we are our system, we know that the makeup of who visits those libraries is different, but we also have to think about what is it that our county is facing. Uh, currently, we are really expanding our workforce development because we know that this pandemic has um, unfortunately made Prince George's County the highest unemployment rate in the state. So that is something that we want to address. We work with our partners to do this. Um, so those are the kinds of things that this framework helps with. Um, just wondering, you know, when you start talking about mission, vision, and values, it gets a little lofty. Uh, could you or Angela or Nick comment about the differences between a mission and a vision for our listeners? I mean, a simple way for me coming into this um, late in the game um, was to think of the vision as something being very aspirational and the mission being the actionable aspect of this whole framework to get us to the vision. And so that's just a very simplified way that I've come to this and kind of distinguished the two roles. And so what's the purpose of the values? Anybody? I can the value, the, go, go, oh, okay, I'll take it. <laughs> Uh, I mean, there are many, many values, uh, obviously, that, that the library uh, espouses and, and, and pursues and promotes. Uh, so the six that ultimately were identified and, and were part of the, the video at the beginning of this uh, uh, live cast, those are just the six that the planning process thought were most central, not the only values, not even close to being the only values. Uh, you know, I think there was a pretty long list of values that were brainstormed that were all very relevant uh, to the library system. Uh, but the values that we identified as those core six, they are part of a, a almost like a, a signal that the library wants to send to the community and to send to the staff to say, this is how we want to behave. This is how we want to interact with our, our customers in the community. This is um, the kind of culture that we want to be a part of, both internally and externally. And there are many, many other things that can be added to this list, but uh, you know, we want to be welcoming. We want to be accessible and collaborative and resilient and kind and, of course, curious uh, because we're a learning organization. Uh, so that's how I would characterize it. Excellent. Nick, do you have anything to add to that? Sure. Um, just a, like an example of, of this, there there's both the internal side of applying to values and then also the external side. So for example, on the staff development piece, if we think about kindness, collaboration, resiliency, accessibility, curiosity, and being welcoming. These are all things that we are thinking about kind of on a daily basis. We're not necessarily looking at a, a check mark and saying, okay, we're, we're incorporating these values into our work, but we're thinking about how do we approach working together differently, regardless of the challenges of having to work virtually in many cases, or work with limited staff in a branch, and how do we make sure that we're being as collaborative as possible? How do we demonstrate kindness to our colleagues, knowing that they might be dealing with members of their family who are sick with COVID, people who have passed away, people who have become unemployed in their households and such. Um, so these are, you know, in the same way that we bring these values into our work that serves the public, um, taking care of each other internally is a piece of that. It's kind of like, um, if you think about your health and if you're someone who doesn't go to the doctor frequently, how can you take care of others if you're not taking care of yourself as well in that process? And the internal and external application of the values is really, really important to us. Excellent. 
Um, what were some of the discoveries that we might have had or that you had while hearing from the community during this planning process? And Angela, you might have heard it through our board conversations. One of the things that I know my, uh, my team, which is over communications and outreach, is really focused on all the time is how do we um, improve multilingual access to what the library does? This is a tremendously important thing that we tackle on a daily basis that we're not anywhere near perfect on, but we are making strides to improve. Um, we have about a 20% Hispanic and Spanish speaking population in the, in the county. We have almost 20% population of immigrants. We have uh, six major languages representing Africa, Asia, uh, Europe, and Latin America that are spoken uh, in the county in a very high rate. And, and well over 25% of our school kids in the public schools are non-native they don't speak English as a native language. So we have a, a tremendous amount of work to continue to do in order to make sure that whenever someone comes to the library, whether it's digitally, whether it's at an outreach event, whether they hear about us in school or they actually walk into one of our branches or hear about us at a sports game when we partner with sports organizations, that they know that we're gonna welcome them. And that language piece is so significant, especially for folks that might not have coming to the library as part of their family culture, um, which is, is has nothing to do with your language or your heritage. That's just something that some families are, are not used to. Um, that first moment of, of potential connection is so important. And if they come to one of our buildings, for example, or if they send in a question and they don't get the help that they need just because they asked it in Spanish or French or anything else, we failed them in that moment. So we have a lot to do in terms of um, continuing to figure out ways that we can be as responsive as possible and grow new staff expertise. One of the things that we're thinking about now is how do we get more staff to have American Sign Language expertise? We have an amazing colleague named Rosemary who leads our conversation club and our weekly ASL story times. And that's been really wonderful, but we're, we're putting all of our hopes and dreams on one staff member and that's too much to, to bear as one staff member. So we've got to get her some more support. And it's, um, these are challenges, but they're, they're, they're more so opportunities for us to really stand apart as a library that, that sees that there are things that we can always do to be there for our, our customers in a better way. I would offer uh, a couple of thoughts, uh, sort of tying into what Nick said, the inclusion sort of area of focus or pillar of the, the strategic framework was one that was uh, particularly surprising to me, not in the sense that it wasn't important in my mind, because it is very important, but it was amazing to me how uh, frequently that was cited in a lot of different contexts. Um, and it, it, all of the things that have really come to the forefront over the last year or so, and certainly the last 12 months, uh, with the, the emphasis on anti-racism and, and social justice. Uh, but it, it, it's even bigger than that, because you get into the access issues uh, that, that Nick was talking about. There are segments of the community that aren't necessarily uh, served as well as they, they could be or should be by the library system, you know, for language reasons, for example, uh, you know, that if, if we can't communicate with them in a language that they speak, how can we really serve them effectively? Uh, and so building those capacities within the library system are really, really important. Um, I also found it really interesting how um, many uh, of the stakeholders that we talked to were really excited about the collaborative potential of the library. Um, you don't normally think of the library system, at least I wouldn't, uh, just coming from a more traditional library uh, conception, uh, you don't necessarily think of the library as being a public health organization. And yet we have a collaboration with the county's public health department, uh, as well as working with nonprofits and other organizations in the community to promote good health practices, good health information, uh, trying to uh, be a resource for the community 
and, and help those other organizations do their jobs better, more effectively, because they have limited resources too. And so if we can help supplement their work by focusing on the things that the library does really well uh, in connecting to community, connecting to, to uh, the, the, the people who come to the library system and give them the information and the tools and the resources they need, that collaborative aspect is amazing. And the extent to which it permeates every single part of this framework um, is really exciting. And I was really gratified, just really happy to see how much the community embraced that collaborative uh, culture and, and, and strategy for the library. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree. I had the same thought that Brett did. The collaborative portion of this entire process was just really um, encouraging and inspiring. And I think, you know, a couple of examples were um, in some of the workshops that I was able to participate in. I would be with staff members who weren't even thinking in terms of the framework, but were just like, we should, we should do this for teens or we should be making sure that, you know, seniors are connecting in you know this time of isolation and other things that just really resonated with me and just showed the passion and commitment that they have to serving the community and needs which is reflected as brett said throughout this entire framework so very encouraging yeah and and you both mentioned it but I, we can't uh say it enough that our public facing staff are just heroes um they, you know, and there's so many people who say, I can't wait to go to the library to see, and they'll name a librarian. It's not about being in the building because they're getting their books and they're getting programs virtually. It's about that connection. And it's about seeing that pe those people that they've grown to consider family. Um, and most people will tell you, oh, Spaldings, that's my library or Laurel, that's my library. So there is this sense of ownership that our customers have with the branch they frequent the most, or perhaps the one that's in their neighborhood. Um, I, I think that's really, really significant in all that we do. And, you know, this framework also has, has you know, I feel like we were a little bit um, ahead of the times because we really didn't know that this pandemic was going to strike and we didn't know everything else that was going to come to the fore. But I think we were ready to strengthen um, our services in a new way. Uh, and the pandemic brought some of that out. So how do you think the framework informed the library's response to the pandemic? And I'm gonna go to Nick first on this one because his, him and his team have done a, you know, extraordinary, extraordinary uh, just bulk of this work, bringing all of this to our customers in this format. And I'm thinking of that now because the weather's getting a little dicey where I am and, and yet I'm connected with all of you. So um, can you talk a little bit about that for us, Nick? Sure. Um, well, thank you for the kind words first off and, and thank you to everyone on the team in CO and beyond who had a big role in all of this. Um, you know, we, with the pandemic, um, it, because it had such a significant impact on our work, work kind of methods uh, with moving to entirely on telework for the first six weeks with just a, a, a skeleton staff. Um, it really heightened our focus on the need to kind of workshop and prototype and just start operating with things because we didn't have any other choice. We needed to be there for the community and we needed to figure out what was gonna work. Um, but in that kind of emergency situation, it's not sufficient to spend all this time trying to develop what's gonna be perfect. So we had to really jump right into things and iterate as we were um, identifying what was gonna work and what was gonna help the community. One of the things that we did right at the very beginning of the pandemic was put out a system-wide survey where we said to the community, hey, we know that 
we're in a weird place right now as a, as a society and community. Can you please tell us what you need us to give to you? What's the most important thing while we're prototyping things and doing virtual events for their first time, um, bringing folks from county agencies on to do programming where we were previously depending more on our branch staff who weren't available at that point. And um, the the collaborative spirit to, to problem solve, um, I think has really, uh, set us up for years and years of success tied to the strategic framework because we, we figured out how to work together and appreciate different perspectives and work through some challenges. Whereas if we were kind of in normal modes at our different buildings, not seeing each other as frequently as we might virtually, um, the the urgency to figure out what will work isn't necessarily always there. But in this situation, we were and basically what ended up happening was gradually as we went through 2020, um, we were able to bring more people into the fold from virtual programs. At the beginning, we were communication outreach staff and area managers doing all the virtual programs for the system, which was wild and delightful. And everyone got to read their favorite books and things like that. And then um, we got the branch staff back online. And then we got some staff to do programming who previously weren't able to because their jobs in the branches require their focus to go elsewhere. But in the adjusted operations, they've been able to really explore their creativity. So all in all, it's been a tremendous, tremendous opportunity for everyone to get together and um, get creative and think outside the box, which is where the, the really special stuff starts to happen, I think. Yeah, and I think, you know, the framework has those same kind of tenets, is that, you know, this is about um, being flexible and changing and moving forward with the community needs. Um, kind of always knowing that those are changing. Uh, and so, you know, when we do get to open in 2021, whenever that is, we know that some of the things we've done during the COVID, our customers really love, like curbside. Uh, they really love virtual programs. So when we do open, we're going to see some changes because we're going to keep some of the things that worked and then we're going to change some of the things in the branches. So I think... Um, the framework sets us up to be really uh, flexible in a way where we have these focus areas, we have a strong mission, vision, and values, and the rest is just going to evolve as the community hopefully um, goes on the website and says, you know what, I did, I did this on virtual, and I think this would be a great program to keep, or I love your yoga, or geez, you know, when we get back, could we try this? So I think it's about continuing the conversation with the community and this feedback loop is really, really significant and something that we're gonna concentrate on. And if Nick, if you wouldn't mind bringing up where um, community members can add their feedback, that would be awesome. Um, we did get a lot of feedback from you all during the survey and thank you, thank you for doing that. So um, I'll just give you the kind of path here. So if you go to our homepage first, which is pgcmls.info, um, and then scroll down a teeny bit, you'll see here at the top is our alerts box. So that's the key things you need to know um, that have to do with operations. You can close that out when you're done reviewing it. And then you scroll down a bit, click on a strategic framework, which will take you to our handy dandy strategic framework section. Um, you can watch the video that we did that we showed at the top of the program in Spanish where we have colleagues who speak Spanish speaking about all of the content, which is really great. Then scroll, scroll, scroll down to the bottom, share your feedback. And there is a form here that you can fill out. Um, this is really not the extent of the feedback process. Like any way that you can communicate with us is dandy. We want to hear from you on social media. You can send an email to ask a librarian at pgcmls.info. We are beta testing WhatsApp. So you can actually send a WhatsApp message if you use that. Um, and we are really responsive and we're tracking all of the uh, the messages that we get across every platform and also the surveys that you might get through our email service. Um, sporadically, every couple months, a uh, survey goes out. And um, you know, this could be as simple as you saying, I love that program, just like Roberta said, or you coming on and saying, hey, I, I know that you're really committed to doing this thing, but it's not coming across in some of your, your email marketing, for example. So can you adjust how you're doing that? There is no suggestion that we don't want to hear. You know, we, we're really keen to see what everyone is thinking and how we can continue to refine what we do in order to better support everyone. So
So I'm going to ask what are some of the projects in each one of the focus areas that our panelists might be excited to see come about. Um, in each one of our focus areas, you'll see some of the um, projects that have started or will start. Um, and it's also, it uh, was mentioned um, by one of my colleagues in the video that some of these projects are starting. Or is there something that you've really liked over the past six months? And we'll tell you what, what category it's under for the framework <laughs> and how it connects. <laughs> you say you all do so much. I'm like, oh my goodness. I, I'll, I'll jump in uh, to start. Um, I had in a previous career, I did a lot of work in uh, economic development and workforce development arena. And so I'm really excited to see the library system uh, take a very active role in helping to to really strengthen the capacity of the workforce here in the, in the county and to um, help invest in building a workforce here that can support the kind of economic activity, the economic growth and economic diversification that the county really needs. Uh, and that's a, a central part of the county government's broader strategic plan. Uh, you know, for the county to be successful, it, it really needs to flourish economically. And a big part of that is having a workforce that has the skills and the abilities to be able to uh, perform a lot of things. And so I'm, I'm really happy that the library is, is taking an active role in this and has uh, already developed you know, multiple partnerships uh, with both uh, public sector and private sector organizations to, to do this. So this is a big thing. Um, well, I, I, to Brett's point, I think that all of these different areas, there's great work being done in all of them. They're all really important and they're all great at meeting some of the needs of our community. Um, I really um, have appreciated the work that's been done in the healthy living section. Um, I know that the summer meal programs has been really um, important and needed. And I know that we're partnering with um, our public school systems and helping them through their virtual learning. Um, since they can't all meet in a building, um, obviously. So that's all been really great. And um, I'm really looking forward to seeing that expand um, and, and what comes out of this area too, particularly with mental health, because I think that that is um, an, an area where um, the framework allows us to also go and, and serve the community in a number of different areas through this time and beyond. A really cool example of a lot of things coming together just from what Angela mentioned um, was a relief event that we did in December with council member Danielle Glaros and Greater Riverdale Cares, where it was their big holiday food distribution, but they wanted to take care of, you know, the holistic humans and the families and the kids. And we had the opportunity to bring books and to give away books and promote our books from birth program at this food distribution so that community members were walking away with an enormous turkey with all this fresh produce with new books for their kids English or Spanish it didn't matter we were there for everyone and then Parks and Rec which was another great partner was giving out some great activity kits and helping us out as well so there there's a lot of um, synergies that can be found and you know when we all work together is when the greatest impact um, will happen and uh, it's very special to see people excited about books as much as they are about other things. And, um, you know, we nerd out and we're super excited about books, which is, which is why we got into libraries in the first place, as well as the social impact. But um, there, there are so many connection points between all of this that, and that when we can really combine it all, it, it's, the, it's very special, I think. And I was just going to mention something I mentioned to you all in the green room is that the library is working, um, and this kind of goes under the, the inclusion, um, on our equity, diversity, inclusion, and anti-racism across everything we do. And I think that's so significant um, with the community that we serve and the times that we live in. 
and our ability to offer such rich programs with the Human Rights Commission um, and some of our partners on all of these different things, the work that our LGBTQ plus team did that won us an Urban Library Award um, was tremendous in really looking at how we are inclusive. Um, the Heritage Hub that was created by our teams also looks at people from all different walks of life and all different cultures. So really giving us this broad spectrum of who we serve and why, um, because we are fortunate that we have such a diverse community with so many exciting and interesting people. And this is a way for us to celebrate this year round and not wait for a specific month, but also for people to be able to find themselves in this, um, in the library, uh, no matter where they, they're coming from or their lived experiences. So I'm, I'm really excited about this work. I'm really proud. This, this, this feels like community to me. This feels like social impact. Um, and a lot of the programs we do are based on books. So you know, there you go, literacy again. Uh, so I just think it's it's just been a really special time for us to really dig deep and do some exploration in this area. Um, Nick, do you know if we have any questions from our audience? Um, I'm sure we will. We haven't seen any yet. We've had some great comments and I just would love to give a special shout out to our friends at Children's Mental Health Matters uh, Maryland, which is one of our partners every year. And uh, we were really fortunate to partner with, with them on programs and also getting resources out last spring. And uh, we've just committed today, in fact, to to re-up uh, for, for 2021, which is super exciting. Um, so just, I'd love to share a comment that that our partners shared, and it is, uh, every child is one caring adult away from being a success story. This is true for library staff also. You are such a great example for children. Thank you for continuing to be open and serve during the pandemic. It's crucial now more than ever before. Um, there's a thing that I saw in the news today, uh, which is neither here nor there, but uh, it, it referenced the extreme spike in children's mental health um, crises that are going on. And let's not forget that that also applies to adults and teens and everyone else. We're all kind of um, working to cope through a once in a, in a hundred years event here that uh, is really changing our lives in a significant way on a daily basis, not to mention everything else going on in the world. Um, but this is a really important thing. And, you know, at, at the end of the day, we can provide resources, we can connect folks with programs, we can connect you to hotlines, we can connect you to, to um, caseworkers, to um, counselors. But some of some of this work that that we're we play an important role in doing is destigmatizing the really tough topics like mental health. Um, and you know, when we as a trusted community institution say this is something that we are all facing it's because it's true. And it's something that we all need to kind of tackle together and support each other in because it, it, it if the stigmas continue around mental health, folks are not going to feel comfortable go seeking out the help and asking each other for support. And, you know, there are times when people will come into the libraries or even just virtually say, hey, I, I'm struggling, I need some help. And you wouldn't think that that's our job, but it is our job. It's our job to connect people with whatever services or support they might need. That doesn't mean we're the service provider, but we know how to connect people. And that's that's the, the name of the game at the end of the day. And we have great partners like Children's Mental Health Matters. Um, the, also Prince George's County Health Connect is has extended their special enrollment period for health coverage. Um, and they've been a really wonderful partner in this time. Um, so thank you again to Children's Mental Health Matters for jumping in there. I know I probably went off on a tangent, but no, that's okay, because what it does is it shows, again, that the library is the convener. Um, we want to make sure we are a trusted source of information, and that's why we have partners that are experts in the field, because we are not experts in everything. Um, so I think that's, it's, you know, I think you put it lovely, uh, that we are in this together. And I think that's what's made me so proud during the strategic framework, the, the process of this, and also what's happening um, centered around our focus areas is that there is this feeling that we're in this together and and being Prince George is proud. And, you know, our county has done a fabulous job of, of leadership um, 
and the library wants to be a good steward of the information that we're given and the information that's out there because you know getting accurate information and getting the services and and the books and everything else you need to, to help you during this time that's what the library is here for so uh, that was a great comment i appreciate it so uh, do let us know if you have any questions out there in the audience miss vivian we haven't gotten your your question yet and i know you've, you've got one for us so let us know when you've got that ready um i have a question for oh here you go miss vivian wrote in she asks do you enjoy what you do and i think we'll toss that to roberta and brett and angela if you don't mind answering oh well i've got the greatest job in the world i mean i get to lead passionate talented staff who serve the community in just incredible ways. And Brett was referencing the workforce development. The workforce development team gave me a presentation this week. I'll share it with the board. Mind blown. I mean, they are going to start addressing some really critical needs in the very near future. And so I'm thrilled with the work that my team is doing. And I'm passionate about serving the community. So yes, I love my work. I love meeting people like Miss Vivian, our, our our, our rock star fan. And we have a very great board that supports our work as well. So for me, it's it's just a win-win. Um, I wish the circumstances were different right now, but I think we've been able to learn a lot uh, during this process. Well, I'll add a board member perspective. Uh, I, I really love being a member of the Board of Trustees uh, and I've been on the board now for four and a half years. However, I have to say that I am very jealous of the staff at the library system because I'd love to do your jobs. <laughs> I mean, I think it would be an awful lot of fun uh, to be able to serve the public in that way, uh, to just bring so much joy and enlightenment and anything else that the library system does. I think that's just a wonderful thing. So I'm envious. I wish I had your jobs, um, <laughs> but I, at least I get to do a little bit as a member of the board. Oh, absolutely, you do a lot. Um, yeah, and as, as a new board member, this has just been a really thrilling um, experience for me. I'm learning a lot. I feel like I didn't even scratch the surface of everything that the library does for our communities, but in, to be able to give back in this small way to, um, to this community is, is really special. Uh, my fellow board members are, are fantastic. I can't wait to actually meet all of you in person. It's, mm -hmm. gonna, be, it's gonna be really nice. Um, but yeah, there's just, there's just a, a collective just sense of this is what we wanna do. This is important and we're all here for one another. Um, that's really special and, and has been um, really great to be a part of, so. Yes, I enjoy my role. Awesome, thanks Ms. Vivian and thank you everyone for, for responding. Um, the next question which is uh, from our partners at Children's Mental Health Matters is, who is the best person to reach out to for collaboration? That is a great question. Thank you for reminding us to tell everyone the answer to this. Um, and that is, Anyone, anyone affiliated with the library is the best person to reach out to for collaboration. Um, the way that we're working right now so collaboratively is, is it, it means that when you reach someone, whether it's a board member or whether it's a member of the friends groups or if it's a staff member uh, answering the phones or someone that you know at a branch, um, everyone knows where to take the information internally right now, which is amazing and unusual. Like this is a very unusual thing in organizations. <laughs> so um, it is, you know, come to any entry point that the library's community offers, even our partners, right? You know, as Children's Mental Health Matters, if someone came to you and say, hey, we need to contact someone at the library in Prince George's County, who's the right person, you would know who to send them to. So there are kind of two approaches if you want to get into the nitty grittiness of it a bit more. Um, if you're trying to collaborate with a specific department or branch or program area, we'll eventually connect you with the department or the branch team. Um, so a perfect example of that is, um, 
the Prince George's County Economic Development Corporation. They've done a lot of programs with our Laurel branch, uh, but over the, the past few months, um, the partner said to the Laurel team, hey, we wanna do something system-wide. So then the Laurel branch team came to my team, uh, which oversees programming and, and community partnerships and said, hey, can you talk to them because there's an opportunity here for us to expand what we're doing at the branch level to system-wide. And now we're all working together to uh, strengthen that partnership. And uh, we actually have them coming on to our community conversations program this Thursday at four o'clock and the Economic Development Corporation will be talking about their great resources with our colleague, Shannon Crooks from the Hillcrest Heights branch. So um, really, you know, we are a big extended family and we know how to route things internally. So just just get to someone in the extended network and they'll they'll know where to point you. Don't worry about the specifics of departments and roles. The other the other way to connect with us is of course social media and email. We have all those numerous uh, channels that you can reach us through at PGCMLS on all of the social platforms. Uh, PR at pgcmls.info on email or ask a librarian at pgcmls.info. And again, things will get routed to the appropriate staff. Um, but we're always 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 welcoming. Um, invitation to collaborate. Um, I have a, another question to throw out to all three of you, if, if you're okay. willing. Um, sure. What are your thoughts on the roles that we as a public library can play for families at different stages of life? So we think about like what all of the programs and services we offer. If you are someone who was just born, we've got a program for you. If you are in elementary school, we've got a program for you. When you're a teenager and there's angst and you wanna talk about a topic, we've got a program for you. And likewise through adulthood and uh, when you're a senior citizen. But just would love to hear some of your, your thoughts on the way that the library engages with folks at different stages of life. Well, I think I would answer that question by saying, um, you know, it's worth a visit, especially uh, when we come back into in-person visits. Uh, it's also worth taking a peek at our website. Um, as we've mentioned throughout tonight, most people don't realize how many things the library has to offer. And I think for some people, it just amounts to um, doing some exploration and realizing that we offer meditation and we all offer career exploration uh, classes and you can learn digital literacy and you can um, join a book club, which is, you know, more traditional. Uh, you can hear a story time. There are so many different ways to get involved with the library and to see what we do. Um, and so I would encourage people to explore uh, both our web page, our virtual events, and eventually our buildings again. Um, look at uh, the breadth and depth of the things that we offer to the community, and I am positive you will find something that um, strikes a fancy. My personal discovery was Creative Bug, which is a art database where you can learn everything you ever wanted to know about art and not just painting, but music. And, you know, it's just a plethora of creativity and it's, it's a lot of fun and I had and it's all free. And, you know, these are classes that I typically might've gone someplace to pay for. Um, and now I can do them in the comfort of my home. And it's a great, I mean, we're talking master level artists are on this thing. It's its just amazing, the levels. Um, it doesn't matter if you're a beginner or intermediate or advanced artist, there's something for you. Uh, if you're just a, a crafter like I am, um, there's something for you. And it's just a lot of fun. So my advice would be no matter what age you are, get out and explore what we have to offer. I oh, know that was a long answer, but that's not my answer. <laughs> Right. I'll, I'll jump in. Um, when you talk about kind of the impact the library has on families, it's probably natural to think in terms of families with children. So I'm not going to go that route. I'm going to go the opposite route. And I'm going to talk about um, the senior members of the community and how the library is engaging with the that part of the community and what it needs to do to engage the senior uh, segment of the community even more. And the last year in particular has been both a blessing and 
a cautionary tale from my perspective. Um, and I, I say this with absolute confidence that the library system is doing everything it can and is committed to, to working on this. But when we shifted to almost exclusively digital services um, back in March, that had an impact on some parts of the community that don't have digital access uh, or don't have the literacy in digital communications or digital media and, com and computer systems to be able to access the library system. And um, older uh, residents tend to have uh, weaker digital skills. They, they just don't have the experience or don't have uh, the technology or don't have um, even, or maybe the interest. Um, and I understand that too, because I like physical books. Um, I, I don't really like reading eBooks. And so that's just a personal preference, uh, but I suspect I'm not alone in that regard. But to the extent that uh, the library is serving now a very diverse uh, community and population, some of whom absolutely want and need all of these digital services and the, the opportunities that uh, they provide. But we also need to make sure that we're still providing all of the services that we have traditionally provided in person or through other means other than digital. And that's something that is a challenge for the library system uh, because we don't have unlimited resources. And so to the extent that resources are committed to uh, digital media, that's, that's resources that aren't available for physical media or the more traditional types of services. And there's not an easy solution to that because both types are essential. Both types are needed. And uh, I've been very interested uh, and active in trying to understand uh, the decision-making process that goes into how do we invest in our capacity as a library system to serve all of these different segments of the community. And the senior community is a very, very important one, very active. Uh, many of the most active volunteers in the library system come from that part of the community. And so uh, speaking as a board member, I want to make sure that we are providing the level of service that, that they need. And I know that Roberta and Nick and the rest of the team at the library system on staff are committed to that as well. So I hope I can provide some reassurance to everyone that while we are doing a lot on the digital side, we are not forgetting the more traditional side too. And seniors, we can help you with your digital services too. Um, we have lots of librarians who are very versed in digital and they can, they can walk you through it. So give us a shout, give us a call. And um, without advertising it too widely, I'm pretty sure if you need some basic tech support, our, our staff are happy to help you over the phone if you reach them in terms of like, oh, my computer's crashing. Well, try making sure it's plugged in or unplugging. There, there's some basic stuff that we're always happy to help on, but that is definitely an area of, of opportunity that we have that that um, that Brett has uh, very well highlighted and, and shared with everyone. And it, it is, it is um, an important thing for us to, to, to figure out how to do better as a library. And, you know, here on screen, you can see a few of our partners in the community who do a lot of this important work. Um, and one of the ones that I'd love to just highlight that folks might not know about is the Maryland State Library for the Blind and Print Disabled and also the Deaf Culture Library, which is run by, by the folks at um, MSL BPD. Um, and basically uh, the, the public library system partners with other agencies in order to expand the capacity of what we can offer you. And there's no way that we could possibly um, have the depth of a catalog of assistive technology and also 
books in alternative formats that are available through the state library, which works through the National Library for the Blind and Print Disabled for the National Network. Um, so whenever you might say, okay, why doesn't the library, why doesn't PGCMLS have XYZ resource in their catalog? It might be that we depend on the state library for that. So don't ever like be turned uh, away from just seeing our catalog, um, connect with us, ask us. Another thing that folks might not know about is our interlibrary loan service both through the state and then the broader library community where we might not own a book, but we can get it for you without any cost through one of our partner libraries. So when in doubt, ask, and we will do everything in our power to get the resource for you at no cost. It just might mean an extra step on our end. Um, and we do have a question that came in, if, if we're willing to take it. And that is, uh, what resources do does the library have for teachers? Um, Roberta, I don't know if you want to take that, or Angela, or Brett, if you have any thoughts. I'll defer to Roberta. I was going to defer to Nick, because he's the one that's always got him on the go. <laughs> we do have BrainFuse, um, which is an online tutoring uh, platform that has been getting heavy use and helping us with the... Um, the gap, that's achievement gap that's been happening. Um, I think with your link card, uh, student link card, you have access to all of our databases. You can do um, ACT, SAT prep um, through the computer, uh, through the library website at no cost. Um, there is a tremendous amount of resources and they're done um, for teachers and students by age. So Nick, do you wanna um, go through that a little bit more for me? Because I can't see your screen. I mean, I can see it, but I can't read it. Sure thing. So um, <laughs> it's for educators and, and homeschool families and children or f tutors, if you're looking for some resources, it's very simple, pgcmls.info slash school, and we'll get you right to all of our curated resources uh, by age group. So you can see they're uh, categorized for elementary, middle school, high school, and college. There are a lot, lot of other access points for these resources, but we wanted to make sure that the most important ones were front and center for, for um, the educators. So a few things to just explain, as Roberta mentioned, um, the link card. So that is our PGCPS students. They have a, a, an ID card as well as an ID card number. That doubles as your library card. So you do not need to come and get a separate library card. Parents in the household are welcome to do that. But the students, you don't need a separate card. It's very easy. You just type in PGCPS and then your student ID number. And then the last four of your student ID number is your PIN. And that, voila, gets you into all of the library's online resources, which is really special. And we have some demo videos on how to, to do that here. Um, as Roberta mentioned, uh, BrainFuse Help Now offers uh, live tutoring in English and Spanish. Every day you can book a one-on-one -on -one appointment, which is really amazing. We also have our own tutoring programs. One of them is called Kids Achieve, which is gonna be virtual this winter and spring, resuming again in March. Um, and that offers one-on-one uh, -on -one tutoring support uh, with a focus on English language learners and reading skills after school. It's a little different than what the school system offers because this is uh, live community members who live locally and you know you can get to know them year over year. Uh, the school system has a really great after school program as well that that is similar to BrainFuse. And then um, there are many other resources. Uh, one of them I'd love to, to share with everyone today is called Lectorum by uh, Make Make. When you see it, you're going to say, why, why is it pronounced Make Make? Shouldn't it be make make? But um, Make Make is the way that the the platform calls itself. Um, and it is a really special e-resource. I might have to log in, apologies. I'm gonna do that while I talk. And um, I don't have my card number on me, so I'm gonna come back to that. But um, this, this platform is a new platform that we have that offers 600 interactive um, children's picture books, Spanish language and also bilingual English Spanish. And the real special component to this platform is that these are books written by authors who live and work in Latin America. So these are books that are not just, you know, your favorite Eric Carle translated into Spanish, but these are books that are representative of the cultural traditions of kids who might be living in our community, who are newly arrived in the United States or who might be first generation born here and their parents are Salvadoran and what does that mean to them? And there are books and stories 
that reflect their family's culture here, which is really, really special. Um, so encourage everyone to check that out. Um, there are research databases for every subject under the sun. If you need to do a paper on Black History Month, well, we've got like six different Black History re uh, research databases where you can get all kinds of great uh, biographical info. And then the other thing for teachers to note and for parents as well, is that our staff can do virtual outreach. So if your teachers want some flavor added to their, their virtual lessons, which I know is a challenge uh, for everyone right now, um, call us up and our staff would be happy to join. We can do it in English, we can do it in Spanish, we can do it in French and beyond. Um, and folks are happy to make repeat visits. That could be as simple as story time. We work with a lot of different uh, tr early childhood organizations where we have librarians going in virtually on a weekly basis to help uh, support the learning. So uh, there is no limit to what we can do for teachers. And on the flip side, teachers, if there's anything that we can do for you that you're not finding, let us know and we'll find a way to get it to you. See, that's why I have Nick do it, because he speaks so quick, but he gets the point across. Um, so any last thoughts about our strategic framework um, from our guests? I would love to hear maybe just a, a closing remark from everyone about our strategic framework and what it means. I'll start. Um, well, I think the key word there is framework. Uh, it's not a strategic plan. It's a framework. So this is a structure that uh, allows us now to fill in all the gaps and, and, and figure out uh, you know, what types of programs and services and capacities that are gonna best meet the needs of the community. Um, and so we've got a process over the next three years uh, to figure out exactly what those uh, things might be. Um, and so, uh, I'm, I'm real excited at this process that we're going to be going through to really um, figure all of this out within this broader framework. Great. Angela, any parting words? <laughs> <laughs> I would also just like to say I'm very excited to see how this framework plays out over the next couple of years. I think that, you know, a lot of work and effort went into it, a lot of collaboration, uh, feedback was heard, thoughts were heard and incorporated into this as best as possible. And I do think that it's a great reflection of our community and the needs of our community. Um, when I first saw it, I tried to look at it from a bunch of different lenses that I have as a mother, as an employee, as a media professional. And I was just really encouraged that this meets all of those different areas and more. And so I'm really excited to see um, what happens next. Great. Nick, any parting comments? Just a, a brief uh, arts analogy for anyone from that side of the brain. Um, you know, this is like saying, okay, we've committed to programming West Side Story next season. And w what does it take to get there? This is like saying we're broadly moving towards this goal. We haven't necessarily... Um, figured out every piece of lighting. We haven't figured out every costume design yet, but we all have the shared commitment. We all know the general direction we're going in. We know the key pillars of what we're doing, and we know that the values that we're bringing to the work. And now we're all coming together as a big giant company, and we're going to learn the dance moves, and then we're going to start executing yeah. a bunch of things. And then after we mounted the first run on Broadway, we're going to do the national tour, and then we're going to do the revival. And it's like this ongoing cyclical process, but it's a really massive, amazing, huge effort that takes all of us and each of our roles whether in the theater world, whether you're the guy building the set or you're the awesome stage manager or playing in the pit or singing the lead role on stage, everyone's role is essential to, to getting us to that end goal. So um, that's my parting words, which were too long, but I uh, appreciate the Absolutely. <laughs> and so I'll just close by saying, you know, that what's really important to us during this process is that we continually speak to the customers, the community, um, that you let us know what we can do for you, um, what your needs are, because we want this conversation to continue. Um, we don't want it to just be a one time, here's your survey, and we never hear from you again. So please let us know how we can improve the services and how we can bring education, literacy, and hopefully some joy into your life, especially now during these kind of trying times. We appreciate you all for being here tonight, and thank you to all my guests um, for spending your hour and 10 minutes.
with the customers and the community. Thanks all. Thank My you pleasure. so much. Good night.